For the longest time, there's been a belief that democracy and capitalism are tied at the hip, that one feeds the other. And there's plenty of evidence to support that belief. A generation ago, political philosopher Francis Fukuyama declared the debate was over with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Democracy had triumphed and could not go backwards. The promise of shared prosperity would follow. That was then. Fukuyama has recently revised his opinion for a number of reasons, including the recent financial crisis, the rise of authoritarianism in the Western democracies, and the growing levels of income inequality. This afternoon's speaker has, a, has thought a lot about these issues. Dambisa Moyo is an economist with an astonishing personal story. Born in Zambia, she earned degrees from American University and Harvard before going to get a PhD from Oxford. Yeah. She worked at the World Bank and Goldman Sachs. Her real breakout was a book called Debt Aid, which argued that interna international aid policies have stunted political and economic progress in Africa. Now, I have to tell you how I met Dambisa. We met at a conference. And my husband met her first, and he said, Melody, there's a woman here who's in an economist and she's black. And like how, there's, a, what are the odds that there are two of you in a room? We sat between each other, I looked over and I said, yeah, I know exactly who she is. I gave one of those looks. And he says, well, you know, you should go and talk to her. I said, yeah, I read the book. And I was snarky. And he says, well, you know, you have so much in common, you should talk to her. Well, he sat between us at this lunch, and we literally sat and debated her book and every other form of economic policy you could possibly imagine over the course of the two hours. And my husband said, no one would ever believe this, that I'm sitting between these two black women talking about detailed economic policy globally. Well, as you know, the book was a huge sensation, and it propelled her onto the international circuit, and other books followed. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She was even named by Oprah as one of the world's 20 visionaries. She also serves as, as would be expected on an A-list group of por corporate boards. Now, she has a new book, and it's provocative, provocatively titled The Edge of Chaos. In it, she goes directly at Fukuyama's reflections. Are democracy and cap capitalism still symbiotic forces for good, or are they starting to wear thin in an increasingly unequal and polarizing world? That's the question. She argues that de democracy may be impeding economic growth by empowering the wrong kind of people. Evidence of democracy's shortcomings include falling voter participation and efforts to delegitimize results. The tools of communications available today also make it easier than ever to spread disinformation, if not outright lies. This result is the kind of divisive politics that makes it harder and harder to solve problems that drive investor confidence and economic growth. Now, if all of that is not provocative enough, her solutions are even more provocative, but I'll let her tell you about them. What I will tell you is this promises to be a very stimulating afternoon, so please join me in welcoming my dear friend, Dambi Samoyo. Good afternoon. Oh gosh, that's a very un-Midwestern welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon. That's better, my God, what am I gonna tell them in New York when I get a New York welcome in Chicago? Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction, Melody. Very often, I feel like I'm attending my own funeral um, when I hear people introduce me, but I'm thrilled to be here, and I'd like to thank the um, Economic Club of Chicago for hosting me this afternoon. As Melody mentioned, I was born and raised in Zambia, um, Southern Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world. And throughout my life growing, out there, growing up there, uh, my formative years in high school, um, having been raised um, for much of my life there, I always was told that the path to economic success was through liberal democracy and through market capitalism. Over the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of traveling to over 80 countries around the world, rich and poor, democratic and non-democratic. And one thing has become absolutely clear. We who believe in democracy and market capitalism are no longer convincing. In fact, people around the world are no longer convinced 
that this is the path to economic success and human progress. What I'd like to do this afternoon is talk to you a little bit about why this skepticism has emerged by highlighting some data points on why economics and, uh, and uh, democracy are under siege. I'd then like to spend a bit of time talking to you about why it is absolutely urgent that we, re we remedy this narrative around democracy, particularly because of a number of economic headwinds that are threatening to append the global economy. Finally, as Melody intimated, I'll offer you a few ideas in terms of how we should fix democracy. It is in our interests, and certainly in my interest, because I do believe in liberal democracy and in market capitalism, that we have to solve these problems, otherwise we risk greater geopolitical risk and ultimately economic despair. So why are people skeptical? Um, and I was telling my parents, I'd like people to think about what they'd say if they were at a dinner party or at a cocktail party, and people said, what is this skepticism about democracy? So what I'd like to do is give you a handful of bullet points as to why today people are more skeptical about the democratic process. In no particular order, voter participation rates are down. In the 1960s in this country, the average voter participation rate was around 65%, in some instances even higher. Today, the average in the United States is around 50%. Worse still, for people who are impoverished, so low-income households of $30,000 per capita per year, I have participation rates at around 30%. Clearly, this is much further away from the one man, one vote mantra that is supposed to define liberal democracies. A second problem is that money has seeped into the political process. According to a New York Times study, just 158 families in this country are responsible for over 50% of the contributions that were made, uh, political contributions made for the presidential election in 2016. Over the past decade, we've seen lobbying amounts double from around one and a half billion to today over three billion dollars. And of course, with the decision at the Supreme Court for the Citizens United uh, um, uh, decree, we know that this is actually likely to get much worse rather than better. A third reason for skepticism is that people have lost faith in the political system. According to Pew, a think tank in the United States, 80% of Americans do not trust the federal government to do what is right on a regular basis. As a part of that, we know that the three pillars of political process, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, have now been called into question by many citizens. In the executive, the office of the president, the use of executive orders has increased, not just with President Trump, but since President Clinton. Worse still, in terms of the legislature, which is essentially Congress, there's such a degree of combat and gridlock that people don't actually believe that the government is able to function. And in fact, the number of shutdowns and threats of shutdowns has increased over the last several decades. Finally, with respect to the judiciary and the criminal justice system, there is a real concern that there are essentially two political systems or two judicial systems. One for people who are white and or rich, and another system which applies for blacks, Latinos, other racial groups, and or people who are poor. These types of, this backdrop actually creates a lot of skepticism and reduces the amount of faith in the political process. Not to belabor the point, but I'd like to give you a few more data points here. According to a World Economic Forum survey, the majority of citizens around the world actually have more faith in authoritarian governments, such as the Chinese, to deliver economic progress than they do in democracies. Perhaps it's no surprise then that the Economist Intelligence Unit just recently downgraded the United States from being a full democracy into being what they call a flawed democracy. And picking up on Melody's point around uh, Fukuyama, there's been a lot of discussion around Freedom House's data that political freedoms have gone down every single year over the past 10 years around the world and over the last two years in the United States. If I haven't managed to depress you enough, <laughs> I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about why economically 
it is urgent that we solve the political process and democracy in particular. We need to rejuvenate and make sure that it's working. In order to do that, I'd like to outline for you six key headwinds, threats to the underlying economy that I consider really structural and intergenerational, meaning they were long-term corrosive for the global economy. And unfortunately, these are all long-term at precisely the time that our politicians and the political system is much more short-term and myopic. Ultimately, it's this schism or mismatch between long-term economic problems and short-termism in political um, approaches that is creating a problem. And later on, we'll talk a little bit. I'll mention a couple of su suggestions on how we might bridge that gap. But for now, let me quickly list for you what some of these headwinds are, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about each of them in a moment. Technology and the jobless underclass. The risk that automation is going to create an underclass of greater unemployment, particularly for low-skilled workers. Number two, demographics. The fact that the world's population is growing at a rapid clip. Number three, income inequality. A subject that when I was doing my PhD, no one talked about. Today, it's absolutely in the top three policy agenda items. Number four, natural resource scarcity. Number five, the sheer amount of debt that the global economy is carrying. And finally, number six, productivity. I won't dwell on this too much on, on these because, of course, I'd love you to buy my book. Um, but let me give you a little bit of flavor as to why these are so problematic. With respect to technology and the jobless underclass, there was a paper that came out in 2013 by two economists at Oxford Martin School. They argued that by 2033, 47% of jobs in this country would be at risk because of automation. To put this in context, in 1900, at the, at the turn of the last century, 60% of Americans were involved in agriculture. Today, less than 2% of Americans are involved in agriculture. And we know what happened. People moved out of agriculture into manufacturing, and out of manufacturing, into the service sector, to such an extent that today, roughly 80% of Americans are involved in the service sector and less than 20% are involved in manufacturing. The reason technology and the risk of jobless underclass is a threat today is because as policymakers and economists, we simply do not know of any sector that is able to absorb the sheer amount of people that are um, lowly skilled, but increasingly skilled, but not skilled for a global um, gig economy. According to John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s, the British economist was writing, he said by 2030, there would be a 15 hour work week. And we are already seeing that type of a dynamic because the unemployment rate for young people, according to the International Labor Organization, now stands at nearly 100 million young people without skills, what they call needs, no education, employment, or training. The second item I'm going to talk to you about is demographics. And for me, this is the most fascinating of them all. Today, we're over 7.5 billion people on the planet. And according to the United Nations forecasts, the world population will continue to grow at a clip until 2100, when there'll be 11 billion people on the planet. It took 125 years to go from 1 billion people to 2 billion people and it's taken about 50 years to go from 3 billion in the 1960s to today where we're trending towards um, 8 billion people. India is adding 1 million people a month to its population. And the world is adding about 80 million a year, which is about the size of Germany. The reality is, even by 2070, nearly half of the world's population, certainly over 40%, will be from Africa a continent which today, which is my home continent, continues to lag behind in terms of trade, in terms of foreign direct investment, and in terms of economic growth. The risks of terror cells, environment concerns, issues around um, migration in a disorderly way are all issues that will become even more acute with the demographic shifts that are occurring. But it's not just about the quantity of the labor force or the work, the, the a number of people on the planet. It's also about the underinvestment in the labor market. And particularly that there is, again, a mismatch between what people are learning and how they're learning and what we need in terms of the work markets. 
According to an OECD report, this generation of Americans, for the first time in the history of this country, over 200 year history, will be less educated than the preceding generation. Worse still, according to a report by McKinsey, the underinvestment of minority groups, particularly blacks and Latinos in this country, who will be the majority minorities by 2050, is so acute that it could put, could put the United States in a permanent economic recession by 2050. It's not that the United States is not investing. It's just that the investments are not yielding economic improvements and certainly not improvements in education. I'll leave you with one last thought. The OECD, again, which is a, a club of rich countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they estimate that the under um, investment in education is so acute that we're seeing in mathematics, reading, and science, the United States slip from um, being in the top one to three highest performing countries down to ranks of number 30. This is something called the PISA survey. If you've got children or nieces, nephews, grandchildren, you must look it up and have a look at where the US is performing. This is simply not good enough. The rest of the world, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets and we need the United States to function at a very high level and continue to deliver innovation and results that can help uh, continue to um, catalyze the world. I'll very quickly go through the last three. Um, income inequality, last four, excuse me, as I mentioned, was a non-issue. Today, why is it right at the top of the agenda and also part of the political discussion? Well, a number of things have happened. For one, the um, social mobility in this country has halved, gone down by 50% over the last couple of generations. That's, this is the probability of being born in a low-income household and ending your life in a high-income house, household through education or job opportunities. Worse still, we simply don't know how to resolve this issue of income inequality. We've tried left-leaning interventions, things like basic income, uh, tax and redistribution, which are very popular on the, for the Democratic parties, but also for uh, across Europe. But that has not worked to stop the spread or the widening of income inequality. We've tried right-leaning interventions, trickle down, supply side, um, where taxes are kept low. That has also not stopped income inequality. And this is, to me, the biggest challenge that, uh, that income inequality debate has. We simply don't know how to tackle this issue anymore. The very last point that I think is also quite troubling um, and makes this an enormous puzzle is that we know that the most important country in terms of GDP is the United States. This is a country that is based on prioritizing democracy and economics through the market capitalist system. China, second largest economy in the world, has deprioritized democracy and has state capitalism at its economic approach. These two economies, number one and number two in the world, completely different political systems and completely different economic systems have roughly the same Gini coefficient, which is the measure of income inequality at around 0.45. Worse still, America's income inequality has widened over the last several decades and that of China has narrowed. And so the question is, and I get this a lot when I travel, which model should we choose in, if we want to tackle the economic uh, issue of income inequality? I will say one last thing and then I'll continue because I know I'm conscious of time. There is a fantastic book that you must buy after you buy my book, um, <laughs> it, which is by a Stanford professor, came out last year, it's called The Great Leveler. It's enormous, you're gonna need a lot of alcohol to get through it, um, but it's a tour de force. Um, his name is Walter Scheidel, and he's basically gone around and looked at over 2,000 years of episodes of income inequality around the world and concluded that the solution every time uh, was not a policy intervention when the income inequality widened. In virtually all cases, it ended up being in some kind of political instability or uh, revolution. It's worth a read um, and definitely worth thinking about. Very quickly, the last few, um, natural resource scarcity. I was privileged to attend uh, a meeting in Beijing with the Chinese president, President Xi. Um, there were about 20 of us who went to visit with him. And he, we asked him, what is it that keeps you up at night? What's the most important thing for the president of the most populous nation? And he said it was natural resource scarcity. The fact that we are simply unable to produce and deliver economic growth and opportunities um, in, in, and certainly not satiate the demand for commodities so that all those people in China, but more broadly around the world, 
could live like the average American. It was simply something that he did not believe was possible. Of course, related to natural resource scarcity are real concerns about ecology and the environment. How are we going to continue to deliver economic success at a time and in a way that actually is really sustainable? And this is, of course, a big issue and becoming only a greater concern. Debt, virtually every class of debt, sovereign debt, which is government debt, corporate debt, household debt, credit card debt, um, student loans, auto loans are all at over $1 trillion each. This is unprecedented. And obviously, a lot of the debt that's been accumulated, certainly by government, has come on the back of the aftermath of the financial crisis. But unfortunately, the only ways in which we can solve this are either through inflation, some form of default, or having economic growth rates that are actually sustainable and large enough for us to pay things back. Unfortunately, around the world, including the United States, no country, or very few, maybe China, uh, is growing at the 7% per year growth rate that we need in order to double per capita incomes in one generation. So how are we going to pay back this debt at a time when interest rates are rising? And this is the question that we have to address. Finally, productivity. For the economists in the room, you will know that productivity explains 60% of why one country grows and another one does not. And yet, most of the time, we don't think about it. The other 40% is explained by labor and capital. Over the last decade, virtually every advanced economy has seen productivity decline, which is a very big puzzle because at the time, productivity, by the way, defined as the amount of output per individual worker. But at a time when technology, the advent of technology has taken such a grip, we simply do not understand why we're not able to produce more or grade more output um, per worker. There's an economic argument that I've written about. It's in the book. So it might be a question of mismeasurement. So think about the moment Benjamin Franklin's kite got struck by, uh, by lightning. Fine, he figured out the electricity, but by the time we could actually roll it out on a grid so we could use it for commercial use and household use would have taken multiple decades. So it may be the case that we're yet to completely calculate and appreciate the benefits of technology. But for now, that's not the case. A more cynical answer is something I've heard a number of times in China. Their argument, or the argument that I've heard, is that productivity declines in developed liberal democracies is inevitable because people, i.e. the average citizen, figures out that they don't have to work as much to get a basket of goods. Um, in other words, the, the voters will constantly be seduced by goods and services by the government, and in that respect, they don't actually have to work as hard to produce output. The debate is still open. The jury's still out. Um, I actually err on the side of there's a mismeasurement occurring, um, but nevertheless, this is a big issue in public policy. I'm going to wind up pretty quickly now by giving you some of the solutions that I propose in the book. Again, um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I will just say a couple of things um, to, to, uh, to help you frame the approach that I've adopted in the book. There are essentially two problems that I see in democracy today. One is legitimacy, the fact that there is a lot of skepticism um, about legitimacy of results. And it's not just about President Trump, it's about the Brexit result. Um, people with concerns about rerunning uh, policies, not really trusting the system, as I mentioned earlier, uh, particularly around the judiciary. But the second point, which I've already alluded to, is about this myopia, this mismatch between long-term economic pro problems that I mentioned to you a moment ago and the short-termism, the sh short-sightedness that we see in policymaking. Remembering that pub with the public policymakers and politicians are very rational. Um, they are simply doing everything that they must do um, in order to win votes. And that is essentially to court today, to today's voter, even though we know that there are enormous costs for future generations. My book offers 10 proposals. Six of them are targeting politicians. Four of them are targeting individuals, voters. It's worth me stressing, because in a moment you're going to think I'm completely insane. Um, it's worth stressing that all of them, every single one of the 10, has some precedent somewhere in the world. Meaning, as crazy as it may seem here, it's actually being applied somewhere in the world today. For example, paying politicians more money 
rather than less, but forcing, themselves, forcing us to insist that they justify their compensation. In Singapore, the head of state, the prime minister, earns about $1.7 million a year. That's the high estimate. I've seen a 1.4 as well, but somewhere above $1.4 million a year. But that's the least interesting thing. The ministers who are responsible for education, healthcare, um, infrastructure, etc., each can get 30 to 40 percent bonuses every year, depending on how the economy performs. In GDP, extending life, reducing life expectancy, excuse me, uh, excuse me no, reducing uh, uh, inflation, extending life expectancy, those areas they focus on as, as uh, metrics, um, they're paid and promoted based on those. Um, but they also face what they're called clawbacks um, if there's a lack of performance, meaning at some point in the future, if they find that they didn't actually create real GDP, um, the money can be taken away from them. Frankly, I'm sure a lot of people recognize that that is a very similar type of system that works in the private sector. The question is, would that make it much more, uh, make, it, make our policymakers much more effective uh, if we had that kind of a system for politicians as well? A second proposal in the book is having minimum standards for politicians. In Britain in the 1960s, the average age of a parliamentarian was around 62. But also, the um, work experience was incredibly varied. They had doctors, lawyers, teachers, farmers who were there sitting there to design policy. Today, according to some of the studies that I cite in the book, the average age is around 40 years old, and most of the politicians actually do not have any experience except being a professional politician. I think that this is a disservice to us, and I think we are missing out on, on great, uh, greater policy making. A third point um, that is worth uh, mentioning is this idea of mandatory voting, so moving on to the voter side. Um, there are 27 countries around the world that have mandatory voting. If we are interested in increasing the voter participation rates, it's something I think we should think about. Uh, Australia, Belgium, Greece, Luxembourg, many countries in South America have mandatory voting. It's implemented in a very simple way. Either you get charged a fine if you don't vote, or more aggressive forms of, of pen, uh, penalties are that you're not able to use public services. So for example, you wouldn't be able to get a job in government if you haven't voted. I know this flies completely in the face of America's First Amendment and the right to choose, but nevertheless, I did put it on the list because I, if we really want to improve participation rates, I think this is something that uh, we should think about. The final point I'm going to mention is weighted voting, which is what I think Melody was dying to hear me talk about. I'm sure she's going to grill me about this in a moment. So it's, I have to confess, my book actually fortunately has been reviewed a lot, and this is, some, this is an area where I think people have misunderstood the argument. Um, I should say Canada and Switzerland are two places where they are experimenting with this. At its very basic form, the idea is to essentially um, allocate a higher or lower weight to voters based on their engagement. It has nothing to do with adjectives such as education, IQ, wealth, race, gender, land ownership. It's nothing like that. It's about engagement. It's worth just stating here that as an immigrant to this country, I am required already to take a test. Um, and it doesn't matter what my background is. Every immigrant who comes to this country and wants to be a citizen has to take a test. And it's the same across Europe. So this is essentially extending this idea. And again, it's not designed to essentially lock out voters. It's to encourage engagement from voters and essentially reward them for participating and understanding what the political system, how it works, what the rights of voters are, et cetera. There are other variants of this. Um, that you could imagine and are, and are being discussed in, in policy circles. For example, in places where they have a lot of referendums, um, so you, you think about a place like California, uh, there's, there are discussions about essentially increasing the weight of people who have experience or knowledge working in a particular area. So for example, um, I frankly don't know what, where the best place for the marginal dollar to be spent in a hospital uh, is. I don't know if we should use the dollar for x-rays or for beds or for medicine. I simply don't know. But the idea is that people who work in that space may actually have better information, better knowledge of what, where that money is best spent. 
it's not to be, again be discriminatory because of course a layman or a woman who's interested in, uh, in voting or, or participating in that vote could learn something about the healthcare system um, and ostensibly get a vote. But for now, at a very basic level, it is this idea of weighting votes based on, uh, on, on knowledge and expertise. And it's the same that you could see for teachers, et cetera. Um, during the Brexit vote, one of the uh, themes that was discussed was whether or not we should be weighting the vote towards age. So this idea that we should give a bigger weight to young people because they were going to suffer or enjoy the consequences of the Brexit vote for a longer period of time um, and therefore should have a bigger weight. Or the counter argument was that older people who had a better understanding of economics and politics and a general understanding of how the world works, maybe they should have had a bigger weight um, on their votes um, because they actually uh, understood these things much better. So this is where the debate is. Um, my book is not designed to be consumed wholesale um, in terms of these proposals. I do have a chart at the back that ranks countries. I won't tell you where America ranks out of 10. That would spoil it. Um, but I will say every country, I, I've only gone for the biggest uh, major democracies in the world, every country has scope for improvement. Let me conclude by just saying one thing, which is the first sentence in the book, which is a quote um, that I found in disbelief, but um, it was so, it's so shocking that, it, that it's true that I decided it was going to be the first uh, sentence in the book. It's a quote by um, Jean-Claude Juncker, who is the current president of the European Commission. It's a critical, important job. In fact, he's the sort of uh, counterface of uh, President Trump. And he said, we all know what to do, meaning politicians. We just don't know what to do or how to get reelected after we've done it. And I think that that, to me, is really at the heart of the problem. I'm going to stop here and take your questions. Tambisa, there is so much. But I want to start and give time to the audience. I want to start with, um, I want to go way back. I want to go back to how does a black child from Zambia go to Oxford? I mean, just give us a little bit about that path, because it's really hard to wrap our brains around. You're saying one of the poorest countries in Africa, and here you are standing at the Economic Club. You've been to 80 countries. You are highly sought after. You're considered a brilliant, fearless thinker. How did that happen? Well, um, just to give you a little bit more context, I was born in 1969. I, I hate to have to reveal uh, when I was born, but I have to in order to make the story uh, sort of more poignant. Um, at the time of my birth, birth, birth certificates were not issued to black children, to children born of two black parents. That law only changed in 1973 in my country. And um, to this day, I have no birth certificate, which you would think should be working for me, but it's not. Um, and instead, I have an affidavit, um, basically, uh, from the government saying exactly what I just said. This is to inform you, Dambisa Moyo was born to two black parents. And at the time of her birth, birth certificates were only issued to, and they list every other race. And I, I find this incredibly powerful because, um, not because I, it's a woe is me tale, but I only found out about that document um, when I was 18 and going to university. My parents, uh, God bless them, decided that that was probably too much of negative information and they hid it from me. Uh, and I only found out because when I got to university, they asked me for uh, identification and whether I had a birth certificate. The reason I bring it up and is- And you still carry that letter in your wallet. I sure do. Because I've seen it. Yes, I sure do. Um, because it, it's a reminder for me of what actually is possible. And I hope that I can leave that message with you as well. The, the world needs the United States to function at a high level. And to me, anything is possible, which is why uh, I adore Melody so much, because she's a kindred spirit in that respect, that you know, within 50 years, someone can grow up in, or be born in a country um, and not be uh, essentially considered human. Um, because of their race, and within that period, they can be sitting in the economics club of, of, uh, of Chicago. I think a lot of that has to do with faith, the faith of many people, different races, different ages, different countries, just believing in me and giving me opportunities, um, sometimes being hypercritical with the things that I'm doing, but I always know that they're on my side. And I will say, maybe perhaps most importantly, just not being ideological about anything. That has helped me a great deal. Um, and it's not that I don't have values. It's not that I don't care about uh, certain things. I do. but. As, a, as an economist, I think the right thing to do is to have an inquisitive mind, 
um, you know, we're living at an amazing age. We're living at a time, as I mentioned earlier, where the two largest economies have completely different political models and completely different economic models. We should, we should enjoy that, that live experiment. You know, what are they doing right? What are we doing wrong and vice versa? And, and to me, I, I fear that we were so doggedly uh, ideological, um, whether it's I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, or I'm black, I'm white, et cetera. And I just think it's to a great disadvantage. And for me, uh, you know, I, I told Melody, I now live by uh, Mark Twain's words, um, which I, I absolutely love. He said, it ain't what you know that gets, excuse me, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that's just not so. And I think that that, to me, is the way I try to manage my life. What is it that I'm assuming that is just not the case? How did you come to have this open mind? Because one of the things when we spend time with you, and I spend a lot of time with you, we always marvel at the fact that you're of Africa, you're of Europe, and you're of America all at the same time. All the colloquialisms, all the jokes, et cetera, by sort of region you know, and yet at the same time, you have an objectivity that is very, very rare. You're of those three places. You are African without a question, 100%. but you're not wedded to, as you say, an ideology. What do you think, how did that happen? Was it your parents moving to the United States when you were young? I mean, what was it that affected that? And tell the, the story about your parents, how they were the five that were oh, chosen. Yeah. So, you know, I, I often say uh, the great tragedy of life is that my parents actually are the real pioneers. My parents, uh, my grandparents did not go to school. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a house servant um, to a British family and uh, who happened to have uh, three daughters. And my grandfather, God bless him, was just in awe of this man. Apparently, he was a dapper dresser, just the sort of quintessential British man in Africa, as you can imagine. And um, the guy who, as I said, had three daughters, told my grandfather, you have to educate your daughters. Like, I mean, you obviously had a blind spot because he hadn't realized that at that time, no black person was getting educated, but always told my, uh, my grandfather this. And my grandfather named my, mom's, my mom and her sisters after this man's daughters. So it's really quite a perverse, bizarre thing. But, but in any case, the point just being that um, because of that sort of intervention, as tacit as it may have been, my grandfather sent my mother and her sisters to school which was a completely insane at the, you know, the first moment that blacks were allowed to go to school. But fast forward, and um, my mother met my father, completely two different tribes, two different parts of the country. Um, they met at university. Um, they were in the first class of, of black graduates. There were 11 in the class. Um, there were like 90 students, but 11 blacks, and they met and married um, there. They spent, actually, I mentioned to some people here, my father ended up doing his PhD in Wisconsin, so we spent a bit of time here in the United States during the civil rights uh, era here, um, very fond memories of, of the United States. But what I will say, just to your more specific question, is I've met too many people who are super smart from too, from too many different places around the world where things are working in a different way um, and things have sometimes not worked. I think China's the obvious one. China was the largest economy in the world in the late 1700s. Um, and somehow they cocked it up, made some mistakes, and they basically lost 200 years of economic progress. And um, I, you know, I'm fascinated by that. How did they squander that, but then how did they come back in the last 40 years to have moved 300 million people out of poverty? That's something I want to know about. Um, you know, they may get it wrong. I, I think they, their progression is, uh, is probably upwards, but I don't think it'll be linear, and I don't think they think it'll be linear. But I think just out of curiosity, we should care about that. Um, we should care about the fact that you know Britain, which is you know a liberal democracy, was an important you know empire leading country, and today it's talking about Brexit and talking about essentially becoming a shadow of itself. How do countries go through this? But also at a very individual level, um, you know I think it's actually Charlie Munger who talks about looking at a problem from many different angles. You know, so something like income inequality, you shouldn't just hear the view from an economist. You want to talk to a biologist, a physicist, a, you know, a politician, a teacher, an education person, how to, to get their perspective on how this, uh, what their models would say about why income inequality exists. And for me, I think that that, 
is the most powerful uh, message for, for my life. People often um, reduce your points of view to sound bites that make you sound very strident. And some of your views are very strident as well. Ah, so, a few. Some. <laughs> so what do you think the biggest misperceptions are out there about some of the things have you written? Let's start with debt aid in terms of debt relief in Africa. What did people get wrong about the book and maybe even me initially? Um, I should just say that I got absolutely killed uh, and, uh, during that process because people with very big names, Bono, Geldof, um, Bill Gates really attacked me. They, uh, you know, in the case of Bono's organization, they rolled out to try and get momentum from Africans. The one thing that saved me, and by the way, I actually like all of them. Um, in Bono's case, I really love his music. I just don't really want him designing economic policy, but that's <laughs> by the by. Um, but one would argue that in their very uh, significant points of view on the other side, it sold a lot of books. I oh, mean, absolutely, and I've said this to you before. I mean, I think that the best thing for me was that they actually decided to attack me because then people said, what is this, what, what are you talking about? Did you feel about? attacked personally or was it the ideas? Um, I thought that it did get to elements of, um, when they started calling Oxford and Harvard to see if I really went there, I don't know if they did it specifically, I kind of thought, okay, this is now becoming a little bit cheap. But, but we live in that kind of world. But can I just make this point that I think people fundamentally do not understand, um, and actually I'm stealing a line from President Kagame of Rwanda who actually saved me because he wrote an 800 word op-ed in the Financial Times about my book. And he said, look, I don't agree with everything she said, but the truth is, as Africans, we always assumed that this aid thing was temporary, supposed to be sort of a, a boost, a booster or some kind of a catalyst to help us um, grow economically. We didn't actually think it was permanent. But the most powerful thing he said is no one should assume that they care more about Africans than us as Africans ourselves. And I think that to me, that there is sometimes, there's this, some sort of subliminal um, sense that maybe as Africans we don't care about ourselves. So you think that's a misunderstanding in terms of the yes, work? Yes, I think that in general people um, think that in, for the work that I, I was essentially uh, you know, pulling up the drawbridge. You know, I, I grew up in Africa, as I mentioned, all my, my formative years, primary, secondary school, university, but also I've been sick in African hospitals, but very rarely do people ask Africans, what do you think we should be doing? How should we be more impactful? There's an assumption that, uh, you know, oh, you're doing just fine, and therefore, you know, you don't want other people to get aid. Uh, and that's just, that's just wrong. What I, about I just, on this book where some might oversimplify that you are anti-capitalism? Again, you know, I've been accused of being, being uh, neoliberal, and being uh, you know, doggedly capitalistic. Um, I think it's people who are looking for a shorthand. That's just not me. And I'm just more interested in ideas, and um, particularly in the evolution of ideas and innovation. So I think it's, uh, it's a pity because, you know, I suppose I could summarize my book in 140 characters, but uh, I think there's a lot of nuance that's missed on. And we, I think, it's, I, look, it's a, it's a, an artifact of the world we live in. People don't have attention span. Um, I've been in rooms like this where I've clearly articulated my view very recently on weighted voting, and I've said I'm completely anti anything that has any leanings of race or gender or wealth or IQ or education. And then I'll see a, a journalist write an article, somebody who was in the room say, oh yes, and Tamisa supports a, you know, an elite view that only people who are educated should be. And I just think, well, they're just looking for a story, but that's just, you know, it's chip shop paper the next day is what they say. When I, before I go to the audience, I want to ask one more question, which is, from where you sit today, when you look at America, and you are um, a citizen. Uh, Will be. Yeah, soon, yeah. very soon. Yeah. God, um, willing. God willing, if I don't get kicked out after this discussion. Because <laughs> this is taped, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, are you optimistic or pessimistic for our country? I am optimistic, which is why I live here. <laughs> because I, of all the countries I've been to around the world, it is the only country where when they seem to be going the wrong direction, they reset, they, re they reflect, and they shift the, um, shift the path in a way that I think other countries consistently learn from, from. And it's not just about politics and policy. 
Um, it's about economics, it's about business, it's about um, education. I think there comes a point where Americans say that may be legal, but it just does not comport with, to us with us in a moral and an ethical sense, and we will just not stand for it. And to me, I think that has been the, the mainstay of what America stands for. And um, I think there are many examples of that happening today. The issue right now about uh, 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 gun control, I think, is an example of, of that. But there are many others, pay equity, um, uh, environmental concerns. They may be legal on the books, but it just doesn't sit well with us as citizens and uh, you know and residents and and I think this is a country which says enough we're not going to tolerate this and we're going to move and for me that we have to eternally be optimistic for that. So interestingly, quoting Bono, he says America is not a country; it's an ideal. It's an idea mm -hmm. that is very important to the world. Would you agree with that? Hundred percent. There you go. We can actually agree. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the audience. Any questions for Dambisa? I can keep going. <laughs> yes. Um, what is your view about the it's Lou. Hold on one second, Lou, for the for the Thanks. microphone. Yeah. Uh, what's your view of Steven Pinker and his book, which says uh, everything in the world is getting better and better? Um, I think uh, Melody would, would know the line. Uh, Past performance is not an indicator for the future, um, and I think that that applies. I think it, it would be wrong for me to say we haven't made significant improvements. The global life expectancy today is 71 years old. That's fantastic. We're now, the average of the world is living at the same levels of, of the, the oldest Roman. So we've made considerable progress, but that doesn't mean that we don't have headwinds. Um, I think the population thing in particular is a real issue in many countries. Um, the fact that we've got slow growth, I mean, another McKinsey report has estimated that um, uh, we'll, we'll see just half of the rates of growth that we saw in the, in, in the years coming that we saw in the past 50 years. And you know, listen to the IMF. The IMF just a few weeks ago has talked about there being a global, another global recession um, you know, looming. By 2020, the world uh, economy slows down. But um, they also pointed out that in their World Economic Outlook report in 2014 that we will never again see the rates of growth that we saw before the um, financial crisis ever again. And I think there are good reasons. Some of those economic headwinds that I mentioned are so virulent that um, I think that there are reasons for us to be deeply concerned. Um, I, sh I didn't even mention, today we have 70 million refugees around the world, um, displaced people. This is the highest number of displaced pe people ever recorded in history, even during World War II. And, I, and for me, I don't see how you can look at those statistics and say, well, everything is just fantastic. One other last data point worth thinking about, there's a fantastic uh, book called The Drugs Don't Work by the chief medical officer from England. Um, but similar themes have been mentioned here by, uh, in this country by Tom Friedan, who's running the um, CDC, the Center for Disease Control. The incidence and prevalence of a whole uh, slew of, uh, of communicable diseases like Ebola, SARS, Zika is, is on the rise. And uh, we are not putting enough money towards combating that. The, these are diseases that we, you know, many diseases that we actually thought that we had put to bed are now coming back. Um, and, and so I, I do understand uh, Pinker's optimism looking back, but I think looking ahead, um, there are enormous challenges that are incredibly unique to where we are today. And they may change in, uh, in peri periods to come, but for the moment, these are real, um, real challenges. We have another question there, yes. Thank you for being here today. Uh, most of the fixes that you mentioned involve pretty seismic political change. Are there more pragmatic uh, changes that we can make to nudge in that direction? Well, you know, people ask me that question and I think to myself, I'm in America. You know, 150 years ago, blacks weren't allowed to vote, women weren't allowed to vote. Somebody maybe came to the Economics Club of Chicago and said, hmm, what do you think about this idea of women voting? And somebody must have said, could we have anything more pragmatic? Because that just sounds completely crazy. And here we are today. So I, I'm pretty optimistic. And you know, if I had to pick one, look, you know, frankly, on a serious note, I'm less optimistic about um, you know, mandatory voting. That's probably a 
hard pill to swallow in this country. But something like compensation, I mean, I say this with a lot of love and not in a pejorative way. Americans love money and they understand capitalism. And I think when they think about something being unfair and people not being paid for performance, I think that's something that I don't see it as being so um, so crazy. And, and the question maybe is who's going to bell the cats? Like how is this going to get done? And I talk a little bit about implementation issues, um, but I I do also think that when things get bad enough and raw enough, I think people say you know what well, it's time for change. We need to do something quite um, quite dramatic. And so some of these things I don't really think are that dramatic after all. Last question. Uh, thank you, Doctor. You you mentioned. Uh, um, the stats around voter participation, right? Particularly here in the United States. Yeah. Uh, have you found any correlation between that period and we used to teach civics and teach rhetoric, right? So though they understood what was happening versus today, I think I'm probably the last generation that actually learned civics. Um, do you think that testing idea you have has to do with maybe just putting civics back in schools and rhetoric? Uh, yeah, I would love it if civics were back in schools. Um, I was just in Seattle last week and a, a teacher uh, came up to me afterward and said, in Seattle, civics is mandatory. And I came here with my students and he had 10 students with him and they said, yes, we're learning civics. I said, fantastic, but it's not mandatory um, in many places in this country. I think it would help a lot. And in fact, you could essentially do away with any form of test if people are knowledgeable. Uh, I mean, there, there's an argument that you want to refresh like a driver's license, but you know, fundamentally, you know, 25% of adults in this country don't, know the, don't even know the three key pillars of the political system. I just think that there's something quite corrosive about that, and I do think that actually, um, I think it has gotten worse. There is a certain amount of disaffection, and there are, of course, income issues, so people don't want to, can't go and vote because they're minimum wage, they don't want to take a month um, uh, time out. And again, going back to the previous question, there are easy fixes. Have the election on the weekend. May, in some countries in Europe, they're subsidizing workers on the day of the election. So there are things that we could do, um, but I, I think if, you, if there are two things that we really want, we want as many people as possible to vote, and we want as many voters to be knowledgeable about the participa participating in the system, then I think having civics um, as mandatory uh, is, uh, is critically important. And dare I say it, can I just say one last thing, which is to pick up on something I've heard from Melody um, before. I think the other subject that should be on the curriculum for students is financial skills. Because to me, I don't understand how you live in a democracy and in a market capitalist society where financial skills and, and uh, civics are at the heart of the beating economy and politics, and neither of those things are, are mandatory. I, I, that to me is, is mad. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Dr. Dambisa Thank you. Thank you.